the name of Allah, the name of God, will start our session uh, tonight. Our speaker tonight is uh, Gary Miller, and he's from Toronto, Canada. Gary Miller was a mathematician, that was his background, uh, but he works extensively in broadcasting for about 20 years. He was also actively uh, engaged since 1978 in public presentations of Islam in many countries. Uh, the topic of today is what does the gospel mean to, the, to Muslims? And as I uh, have heard about Gary Miller, and that's something you have to uh, watch out for tonight, is that whenever he speaks, he will storm your brain. He will make you feel hot in your brain when he finishes. Because always what he presents will make you think more and more about it to the extent that uh, you will feel hot. So I will introduce Gary Miller tonight for his lecture. Welcome. The, uh, Muslim used to have uh, probably uh, a very different attitude about uh, the gospel than he does today. I'm just speaking of the majority or large segments of the community. They used to feel much differently than large segments of the community feel today. And uh, most of the blame for that, I suppose, uh, could be placed on one hand on the Muslim, and on the other hand, on some of the Christian community and how it was that they tried to present the gospel. So I have to talk a little bit about that. I'm trying to uh, clear the air, uh, both for the Muslim and the Christian and the interested bystander. You see, the Quran commands the Muslim to show respect for the books of other people, their religious scriptures, and that commandment was... Um, abused by certain, I stress just certain, missionary uh, efforts by taking these verses that relate to the respect for scripture uh, out of their context and quoting them back to the Muslims saying, look, your book says my book is true. So read my book and then you'll be in trouble because you find out my book's different than your book. And I'm afraid that then the blame has to be shifted over to the Muslim who very often I uh, never thought about that before, but thought uh, that makes uh, a lot of sense. And he was letting somebody else tell him what his own book said. So it was that before too long, when the uh, missionary would on the one hand say, uh, your book uh, says you should listen carefully to my book, now let me read you my book, the Muslim tended to think, well, that must be that your book is full of lies. Uh, even if the Quran says respect it, uh, it must be that some people have put some lies in there because I don't go along with that thing that you're reading. And he looked back into the Quran to try to find some verses to justify that position. To find some verses that say somehow the Christians changed their scriptures and put some lies in there. And that just made it worse because now the missionary said, you're really bad off. Your book on the one hand says believe in our book and on the other hand it says we changed our book. Uh, the problem being that the Quran doesn't say anything of the kind and uh, these arguments that were first brought forward about 200 years ago are reprinted every year by uh, certain missionary groups. Uh, the arguments are old and tired and uh, quite insufficient. What the Quran really criticizes is not anybody else's scriptures. It never mentions the Bible, but as a matter of fact, neither does the Bible. That's just a nickname for a collection of books. What it talks about are scriptures, and what it criticizes is the way that some, I stress, some people use their scriptures. It criticizes the handling of whatever people call scripture. It endorses the fact that the truth has been preserved by people, that they have in their scriptures the truth, but they mishandle it, and makes basically three accusations which probably you could go into any church and the pastor there will say, yes, those things are true of those people over there, the Quran says some of the Jews and Christians pass over much of what is in their scriptures. 
some of them have changed the words. And this is the one that was uh, misused by Muslims very often, giving the impression that uh, once there was a true Bible and then somebody uh, hid that one away and then they published a false one, and the Quran doesn't say that. What it criticizes is people who have the proper words in front of them, but don't deliver that up to people. They mistranslate it, or they misrepresent it, or they add to the meaning of it. They put a different slant on it. And the third uh, accusation was that some people falsely attribute to God what is really written by men. Now, probably in any church there will be people who will say, yes, I know a church that does all of those three things. They pass over much of what's in their scripture, and they've changed things. they put the wrong slant on the words. And they have credited God with things that men said. So really, there's not a, a cause for a, a problem between the Christian and the Muslim on these uh, charges. The Christian would, I would like to think, generally go along with those ideas. And again, I stress, it only accuses some people of doing that. Unfortunately, uh, also in uh, more recent years, uh, discussions of Christianity and Islam have usually been uh, attacks by uh, the Christian on the Quran or by the Muslim on the Bible, uh, which is quite an un-Islamic thing to do, to attack some of these scriptures. But usually these discussions uh, or these presentations are uh, coordinated in such a way as to, uh, for example, the Muslim will be here to blast away at all the errors in the Bible. And then the Christian takes a turn at blasting away the Quran. What is um, really unfortunate and really rather silly about that whole approach is that people who try to do that are trying to do something which is extremely difficult. They are trying to demonstrate the non-existence of a certain item. And I'll illustrate in this way, when you assert that such and such a thing does not exist, you have a big job on your hands if you want to prove that it doesn't exist. If I say there is no such thing as a pink elephant, how am I going to show you that? I have to somehow prove to you I have been all over the world. I've looked in every closet. I've been everywhere that's big enough to hold an elephant, and I have pictures to prove there are no pink ones in any of those places. It really can't be done to demonstrate the non-existence of something. When people single out errors to say, look, there's a mistake in the Bible, they are claiming that nowhere else in that book is there a verse which would clear up this apparent error. It'd be pretty hard work to demonstrate that that is the case. They would have to say, okay, here's chapter 1, verse 1. This verse does not clear up that mistake. Now this verse, that does not put a new light on that verse and go all through these thousands of verses to show there is no verse which clears up what apparently is an error. That would be pretty hard work. The only other way to show that something doesn't exist is to show that its existence would be self-contradictory, and I don't think that uh, that method of proof lends itself to the thing I'm talking about. As to whether or not there legitimately are errors in somebody's scripture, it's simply food for thought. Uh, it is quickly dismissed by a lot of people to say, these are only apparent errors. It deserves a better treatment than that. One James Barr, who has written a number of books endorsed by the Church of England, has suggested that maybe these apparent errors in the Bible are a signal from God. They're a warning. Look out. Don't credit me with this. A man did this. I don't write like that. So that might be a possible interpretation. So it deserves a better kind of a, uh, an investigation than to simply say, I'm sure it's only an apparent mistake. So more useful discussions are going to be concerned with other subjects, I would hope, rather than just trying to find errors in a book. But unfortunately, what happens when we turn to some other matters is that to try to discuss something more important than uh, how well does your book read, people often confuse explanation for proof. That is, you ask a man, how do you know such and such is so? And he tells you how it works. And an explanation is not a proof. I might give you a completely coherent explanation of how television works by black magic. That doesn't prove it does. It just means you could explain it that way. When the Muslim says, how do you know someone died for your sins, and the answer comes back, someone has to because, etc., 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 
God is here, man is there, and we have to pay this debt, and so on and so forth. That's an explanation. That's not a proof it ever happened, or will happen, or whatever. That's an explanation of how it works. And an explanation is not a proof. It's fascinating to dwell on those explanations, and sometimes they do that. Fascinating because virtually all of these explanations are built on analogies, and the analogies are virtually always faulty in the first place. That is, people don't usually even explain things directly. They usually will tell you, well, it's like this. And he tells you about something else. And now he has two problems. He's got to explain this thing and then show you that this thing is really like the other thing. To explain to you that the redemption of man is like a traffic court judge who pays the fines of all the guilty parties is a faulty analogy, for example. Because the traffic court judge is not the offended party. The state is offended and the state does not forgive when the state finds someone. Whoever pays the fine is beside the point. Uh, just to cite there, one example of a common analogy. But anyway, as I mentioned, the real complaint of the Quran is the, the handling of Scripture. So maybe one of the most important questions that the Muslim would want to stress for those who are discussing the Gospel and trying to uh, show someone the meaning they have discovered, the important question might be to urge a person to ask himself, did you discover that meaning in the scriptures? Or did you invent that meaning? And then prop it up with what you found in the scripture. It's a, an old uh, problem. Uh, mathematicians have talked about for at least 26 centuries. To say, do we discover mathematics or do we invent it? It's not entirely clear. Because we make up some rules, we work with it, and then we say, look what I found. But no, you invented it in the first place. Or did you find it? It's a, a delicate kind of a thought. And it's worth examining in the same way. If someone says, look what I found, the scripture tells me such and such, it may well be that's a discovery, but possibly it was a preconceived idea that now fits what is read. Of course, the Bible has been read in a great many different ways. A great deal of emphasis is placed by some on the crucifixion as being the salvation of man. Yet according to the 19th chapter of Luke, Jesus told the certain Zacchaeus, Today salvation has come to your house. He didn't say, Next week, when I die, that will be when salvation comes. He says, Today salvation, whatever that means, is coming to your house. It's rather easy to read that and think maybe the crucifixion is not, not quite what somebody told me it was. It's a possibility. The 14th chapter of John has been uh, quoted by... Well, there's usually two favorite verses in there, but the whole thing put in its context doesn't read quite the way a lot of people tell it. That is, um, on the one hand, uh, Jesus says, no one comes to the Father but through me. And it is often uh, quoted in order to establish some kind of an idea that if man is reaching for God, you've got to talk to Jesus first or, or go through him or whatever. When put back in its context, that whole subject of that chapter is not so much man reaching for God, but God reaching for man. That Jesus says, I came to show you God. Philip said, show us the Father. Jesus said, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He didn't seem to be claiming divinity, because in the first place he's supposed to be the Son, not the Father. Uh, and in the fifth chapter of John, he said, no one's ever seen the Father. But my point is here that um, I'm not going to try to reinterpret the, the Bible. I'm just trying to show that it sometimes just as easily reads in quite a different way than the exclusive way that some have tried to put on it. It is not, and that's a more recent development, I suppose, it is not the Muslim's job to try to reinterpret the Bible. There's plenty of people busy doing that. There's plenty of cultists who will tell you they have found everything in there from flying saucers to word processors. It's not the Muslim's job to find some novel twist on the meaning. It's merely his job to remind an individual that if you are sure about what it says, ask yourself again, did you have that in your mind before, or did you really discover it? This means an encouragement to think, and there are different views on that subject as to whether that's a good idea to think or not. There are in a sense, two streams of Christianity. And the Muslim, is, uh, as a foreign student, is usually quite uh, confused because he never thought about that before. He comes to this country and 
turns on the television one Sunday morning, and after a few minutes, well, that must be Christianity. He'd never seen a Christian before in his life, possibly. And certainly in the minds of those people speaking, they have Christianity. But what the Muslim is sometimes unaware of, he may spend some years in the country and never catch on to the fact that there's a lot of people who call themselves Christian and they have nothing to do with what you saw on television Sunday morning. There are widely uh, different views. And one of the things that divides these streams concerns an understanding of the term lost. What does it mean when somebody's lost? Does it mean that he isn't saved, or does it mean something else? You might ask the question this way, is an explorer lost? If a man is going into a land where no one has ever been before, is he lost? Well, one branch of Christianity would tend to say yes, and another branch would say no, he's an explorer, he's not lost, he's exploring the territory. The problem the Muslim has is not with a man who will tell you explorers are not lost. He has a problem with a man who tells you, yes, until you find what you're looking for, you're lost. That stream of Christianity is the one that gives him the problem, because that is the stream of Christianity that um, does an awful lot of study and preparation, but does not encourage a reinvestigation, an objective investigation of things. As an example, I suppose that the key question of the, the test question to all Muslims, uh, as it is put to them by those who are anxious to bring them into the fold, uh, they want a yes or no answer to the question, is Jesus divine? Is he divine? Yes or no? Which skips a very important matter. The question is, what is that supposed to mean? Is he divine? Yes or no? What do you mean, is he divine? It was uh, Spinoza, a few hundred years ago, who was a Jew, at least by uh, heritage, and he withdrew from the Jewish community. He was quite a philosopher and felt alienated from the community. And there were Christians who came to him and said, now, of course, that you have left the Jews, you will be a Christian. And he said, maybe I will, when I understand what you're talking about. And his main thing was just that, to stick to the definition, to say, I hear the words, but I don't know what they mean. You tell me God became man. What do you mean? Like my father became dead, or like ice became water? Do you mean once there was God and he squeezed himself down, now he's a man, he used to be God, or what do you mean? The words sound like one thing, but the actual definition is pretty hard to uh, explain, if it ever has been explained. As a matter of fact, the insistence on the humanity and the divinity of Jesus is a puzzling thing for the Muslim. It's not trying to be a, a, a smart aleck. He's trying to ask simple, childlike questions of what is that supposed to mean? Because on the one hand, he's told God is 100% holy. That's why God can't deal with sinful man. Man is sinful. He's down here. And God is 100% holy. So we need a mediator. And the Muslim asks, how holy is the mediator? 50%? 51%? And the answer, no, no, he's 100% holy, he's God. Well, then we still have this problem. If the problem is that God, because of his holiness, can't deal directly with man, you haven't really put anybody in the middle if he's still God. Again, it is said, God can't deal with the sinners. And yet Jesus used to eat with them, according to the Bible. It didn't seem to annoy him to get that close to a sinner. My main point is this, however, as the title was announced, what does the gospel mean to Muslims? To the Muslim who has uh, investigated and studied it, and it has been a topic among Muslims for hundreds of years, the Muslim does not really expect, in the first place, that the gospel, the message of Jesus, contains any theology in the first place. There is a verse that's often quoted from the Quran to the Muslim, which says that the Jews and the Christians should have stood fast by their Torah and their Injil, and they would be successful. If you put that all in its context, what is under discussion is the fact that some of the Jews and the Christians had complained that they were not successful. They did not have a Christian state. 
And they were told in the verses leading up to this in the Quran that the reason for that was they had ignored the rules and the advice given to them in their books, the Torah and the Injil. Saying if they had done what Jesus said to do, they would today be successful. So the Muslim does not expect there's any theology in there. Whatever the gospel is, it's a bunch of advice and rules of conduct. It doesn't deal with supple and uh, convoluted definitions of the nature of God and uh, a whole uh, manufactured uh, brief vocabulary to describe all these uh, various subtleties. And ironically enough, there are four books that go by the name Gospel, and the only one with any theology of any significance is the Gospel according to John. The irony is that that's the only one of the four Gospels that doesn't have the word Gospel in it anywhere. That is, if people would explain theology from the words of Jesus, they have to quote from John, not from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which call themselves Gospels, or at least mention the Gospel. Now, I know how the rest of the argument goes, and I'm not ridiculing anybody. I'm just trying to show you that uh, I'm familiar with it. I've heard it many times. The documentation of the, the life of Jesus is usually uh, cited as being a, a proof of the theological claims. And these people uh, will usually start by saying, but look, the Jews who were right there with him, they understood him to claim divinity. So they did. The problem is, did they understand him correctly or not? His disciples didn't seem to know what he was talking about. We're all the way to the 16th chapter of Matthew before Peter gives some kind of a theological statement and Jesus congratulates him saying, you didn't even know that until it was revealed to you. Evidently, it wasn't very obvious by anything Jesus had been saying to that point. But on the other hand, to the Jews, every time he opened his mouth, he was claiming to be God. It may well be that the Jews were misunderstanding him. And that is precisely the point of the 10th chapter of John, where the Jews accused him of blasphemy, claiming equality with God, and the rest of the verse goes on, the rest of the chapter continues on, to have Jesus defuse the situation to show them that if they listened more carefully to what it is he said, and read their own scriptures more carefully, they'd see they had no grounds for a claim of blasphemy. He doesn't congratulate them on their insight, that they heard him right, it's too bad they don't like it, he goes back to show them that they cannot convict him according to anything he just said. Both the Jews and Jesus used the term Son of God of themselves and of one another. What did they mean? Did they both mean the same thing or did they mean different? According to the 8th chapter of John, the Jews came to Jesus and said, We're sons of God. He said, No, no, I'm the Son of God. You're sons of the devil. Well, why should the one be a great theological statement, I'm the Son of God, capital S, and your son's the devil, figuratively speaking, of course. Perhaps they were both talking about the same sorts of things figuratively at that time. In any case, as I said, the, uh, the encouragement is to think these things through, and uh, there are a number of standard objections that are made. That is, if a person thinks too hard about these things, uh, he may be told on the one hand, you're going so deeply into something, you're forgetting something very important. The Bible was written for simple people. Interestingly enough, the same people who say that really mean to tell me that your problem is you haven't consulted an expert. See, on the one hand, you are told it's written for simple people, and in the same breath, you're told the reason you don't understand it is because you don't know enough about it. You should go and ask this man. He studied it for years. Those are really quite uh, contrary ideas. Thinking will lead you astray, people have often said. In fact, I've heard it said, thinking will lead you astray. I want you to think about that. Now, put that all together, you see. Is the thinking going to lead us astray? That certainly is a subject for thought, right? Uh, but then I might go astray. It's a tangled little uh, knot. The common uh, statement, this is a, a substitution of slogans for, for thinking. Another common statement is, if you will surrender your own judgment, God will guide you. Well, maybe he will. But maybe it works like this. Maybe God says, surrender your own judgment, and I'll see to it you go astray. That might be the, the way things work. That also makes a little more sense to me. That is, after all, the uh, 
the view the scientist has. He says, set aside your personal preferences and use objectivity. That is, keep your judgment when you're investigating something. Don't be blinded by what you are sure must be the case or what you would like to be the case. Set aside personal preferences. And that's such a good argument, such a good suggestion, that in fact it is used by some of the very people that I have the confrontation with. Their problem is they say, yes, set aside your personal preferences. But in the list of personal preferences, they put using your personal judgment. So your problem is you prefer to use your head. You should suspend your judgment. The objective questions that, at least I would suggest, are maybe not the ones that uh, people might expect. I think that uh, most often the Christian feels he has a duty to uh, convince the Muslim that Jesus is divine, and the Muslim feels he has a duty to prove that uh, he isn't. And that can be an endless kind of discussion, but uh, I'd say that's probably not a very worthwhile point to get into. I suggest that some of the problems become more apparent if the Muslim asks the Christian to prove the humanity of Jesus. To say, whatever you say he was, uh, I'll grant you that except for this one thing. Prove to me he was a man. How do you know he wasn't God in disguise like a man? Prove he was a man. What did he do that God can't do? Only a man can do. Prove he was a man. Well, there's only one thing. What did he do that God can't do? You have to be a man to do it. And then the Christian will tell you, he died. So God can't do that. Only a man can do that. The problem then is that that same death is supposed to be the saving act which a man can't do, only God can do. That is to say, if we crucify a man, it won't save anybody from their sins. On the other hand, you can't kill God, only a man can die. As um, one Muslim put it about 850 years ago, he said they have a, an idea of God and man, and then a thing, a God-man. And they tell you what we crucified is the God-man. The God man. But when it really comes down to it, it's the God lived and the man died. And that's not really crucifying a God man. Any more than if I tell you I had a sandwich for lunch, except I didn't eat the bread. Then I didn't have a sandwich for lunch. I had a piece of cheese. A sandwich is bread and cheese. To kill a God man, but to say only the man died, not the God, then that that's what happened, not, not the God man thing. And these are not novel ideas. These are things that are appreciated by the mainstream of Christianity. There has always been a doctrine of incarnation. That's well defined. There has never been a defined doctrine of atonement. How exactly it's supposed to work. You don't find that uh, explained in any uh, ancient or modern document. You find a lot of talk about it, but there is no creedal statement on that idea because it has never really been figured out how it is supposed to work. I'm not claiming that proves it doesn't work. I'm just saying that that is still supposed to be an open issue. I know that there is a great concern, and uh, the Muslim who is, well, pestered or annoyed by people in, in, who are anxious to have him come along and come to their church and so on, he may feel annoyed, but at the same time he tends to appreciate that uh, people may uh, have a proper intention in all of this, that they are genuinely concerned. Their concern, though, is related to, often anyway, it is related to getting someone to take an action which brings about salvation. And there's an interesting point about here, and, and human action, that suppose there is an act which is connected with salvation, a human act and a man being saved. Well, according to the fundamentalist view, if there is such an act and it is necessary for salvation, then that same act cannot be sufficient for salvation. That is, if it's something we must do, then it is something that is not in itself enough for salvation. 
I'll explain why in a moment. And conversely, if there is an act which, if you do it, it is enough to be saved, it is sufficient, then that same act is not necessary. That is, if it is enough, then it isn't required. It will do the job, but so will something else. You don't need to do that thing. The reason being that if there is a human act which is both necessary and sufficient for salvation, then you have a human act which is equivalent to salvation. And that goes against at least one branch of Christianity and a basic tenet that there is nothing a man does that is equivalent to his salvation. But that's what you get when you have these two directions of the area of implication. It's necessary and sufficient. It means if and only if. A man is saved if and only if this means A is equivalent to B. It's a difficult position, but it's a position that uh, some have created for themselves. Salvation, as it happens, is not precisely the concern of the Muslim in the first place. That is, the Quran doesn't say anything about it. Salvation. It uh, talks about men being lost, but it draws as a contrast not that they are lost or they are saved. The contrast is that a man may well be lost, or it may be that he has gained something. He is successful to some extent, to varying degrees. He loses out completely, or he gains something, and maybe more than somebody else. You lose, or you are successful. It's not a question of black and white. It's either none or some, not all or none. And so the Muslim's real concern is concerning his actions. He wants to appreciate his limitations and his duties. That's basically all. And that's interesting enough that um, it is the nature of proof that if something is impossible, it is theoretically, or in principle at least, subject to being proved. You can't always prove when something's possible. But if something is impossible, that is always open to proof. And it is always open to proof if something is necessary. You can't always prove something is unnecessary. But you can always demonstrate that something is necessary. And so it is that it can always be established what it is a man cannot do and what it is he must do. His limitations and his duties. And that's what the Muslim is trying to find out about. Not so much about how to get saved, but he's trying to find out which things are a waste of time because they cannot be done and which are the things that I cannot overlook I must do. Now to go back uh, kind of in summary I suppose there are sort of uh, two thoughts that came up here. I spent a lot of time and maybe more than uh, I should have on uh, the treatment of scripture and how it is viewed and uh, for the most part that's for the benefit of the, the Muslim to try to get across to the Muslim that not everybody who uh, calls himself Christian has the same ideas about what the Bible does, what it's supposed to do. There are varying views on that. It is one stream of Christianity that says the Bible is inerrant. These are the words God spoke. Even in the places where he said he didn't. Yes, because there are places like that. What Paul said in one place, at least he said, what you're about to read didn't come from God. There are those who say these are God's words precisely. The mainstream of Christianity doesn't go along with that. When the apparent errors are cited, the usual retreat is to say these are errors of transmission. That is, these mistakes were not there in the original manuscripts. Which might be true, but we'll never know, will we? Since nobody has an original manuscript makes it a pretty empty claim to say, I have a perfect book, I just can't get my hands on a perfect copy. What good is this book if you don't know what used to be in it? But it has not, after all, been so well preserved historically. But at this point, the two streams of Christianity tend to, to meet, because they will both say, yes, but all these apparent errors do not touch on major doctrine in the first place. Personally, I disagree with that, but they tend to agree on this point, both the mainstream and the other branch of Christianity, to say, 
Well, even if there are mistakes of transmission, transmission, they don't touch on major doctrinal issues. At this point, though, the main stream of Christianity will try to tell this other branch that the reason for that is that the Bible itself doesn't talk very much about major doctrines. That's the reason why these uh, verses that may have been miscopied don't touch on major doctrine because most of the Bible doesn't in the first place. So what Martin Luther said about the Bible, he said most of it's irrelevant because his basic philosophy was unless a verse talks about a certain subject, his particular pet subject, he said, then it's doubtful that it is scripture. And in his edition of the Bible, he took the books of James, Hebrews, and Revelation and put them in the back like an appendix because he said they don't belong up here with the rest of the scripture. A hundred years later, they were moved back. But the point is that the attitude that uh, uh, all of it is of equal value is uh, an old and even fundamentalist uh, uh, position. Well, it won't go along with it to say that not all of it speaks in the same way. It doesn't very often really touch on major doctrine. And so the next step in this uh, explanation is to say, but we know that the doctrine has been transmitted historically correct because that's what the Bible is about. It's a record of a continuity of the Christian community. And that's largely true, but remember the original objection was this document of historical continuity has suffered some problems in the continuity. It hasn't been uh, that well translated. Regarding thought, trying to encourage the idea of thinking about these things. Uh, just one uh, final suggestion that I'd make there is to beware of a lot of things that pass for proof. Very often what people consider proof of something is a proof of something which is unreasonable by nature. That is, a person will tell you uh, about a certain doctrine and when you say that makes no sense, they will tell you yes, it is beyond reason. And look, I have proof that it's true. Well, that's self-contradictory. See, if you produce a proof of something that is unreasonable, then something's wrong with your proof. See, the, the scientist who uh, does a, the thought experiment in his mind, and he thinks, if A is true, then B is true, and that would mean C, and therefore D, and that's crazy. Wow, let me call the newspapers. I've proved a crazy thing. See, he doesn't do that. When he, he arrives at something that makes no sense, he goes back and think, well, I must have started with the wrong assumption or there's something faulty in my argument. We don't rejoice at an unreasonable conclusion that arrives at the, by a process of reasoning. Something's wrong with the proof is the usual signal. Uh, so those are uh, some thoughts and uh, I would uh, actually be more interested in what you're thinking uh, than what I'm thinking. Um, if you have uh, some questions or comments, don't be shy to speak up. Thank you for your time and attention in any case. Can we ask you questions not exactly on the gospel, but sure. on, uh, in relation to some words that we hear? Um, Sunnis and Shiites, what, what, um, like we understand Protestants and Catholics, so. Yes, it's not quite parallel to that, uh, historically. Those are, are really nicknames that uh, were bestowed on people. I don't think people, at least in years ago, people did not deliberately tell you I am Sunni or Shia or Wahhabi or something like that. Those are nicknames bestowed from outside, just as I, I don't think the first Protestant said I'm a Protestant. Uh, that is a label that came on. And it basically uh, refers to uh, different approaches to uh, certain issues. Uh, the, the labels were unknown until uh, some period of time uh, after the time of the prophet. I'm saying that uh, well, at least 250 years before people were using these kinds of things. And Shia just came from a, a an Arabic word that means party, like the Republican Party, that sort of thing. And it was kind of a nickname bestowed on people who claim to historically belong to a certain party, loyal to a certain man. And others put the emphasis on saying, 
the loyalty is not to a certain bloodline, but to a certain code of behavior, and that's basically the, the root meaning of sunna, which has to do with characteristic behavior or habit patterns, or <laughs> these two nicknames came about. One is that we, we want to follow the behavior of a certain group of people, and another who want to emphasize it's important that we remember the line of descent of people, and they're roughly divided 90% to 10% of these pictures. Uh, some of the issues that divide them are much more important to a small group of people than they are to the, the bulk of individuals. That is, if you uh, were to approach somebody to say, I take this position and I'm against the position you take, chances are he doesn't know about either one of those positions. It's like a, a layman trying to debate the uh, matters that church councils take up. Usually they don't even know what it is they're talking about in the first place. But most of those issues are far removed from people. Or if they have an idea what those issues are, it may be some simplistic view of one or the other favorite thing that they've carried over. I hope that's helpful. Yes? Uh, I'm just curious. How does a, a Muslim, how do you know if you have uh, eternal life? What, what does a Muslim believe once he dies back to him? Well, as to exactly what happens to him, there's all kinds of stories about that that nobody really knows. Maybe death is as interesting as life. I don't know. It's like saying, what's going to happen to this baby now that it's born? Uh, what's going to happen now that this man has died may be a very complicated thing too, but the uh, first part of what you're asking is how does he know about where he stands? Um, you look at it in this way, that uh, the Quran says that on the uh, on, a, on a final judgment that the record of each man will be put in his hand. And he knows by that record what the decision is, what the verdict is. There's no surprise. It's not going to be a case that somebody looks over his record and he's thinking, this looks pretty close. I hope the judge is in a good mood today. Because this looks like this or that. It's going to be very clear by the record. So given that that is the case, anybody at any given moment should be able to stop and think, what if I died right now? Am I ready or not? Uh, the, the difference between that approach and the approach of some, at least, who would say, I know that I, uh, my well-being is looked after, is that some of those would say that, say, I know I'm saved, and a week from tomorrow I'll still be saved. Whereas the Muslim may say, I'm ready to die now. A week from tomorrow? I don't ask me a week from tomorrow. That is, he knows what the situation is. To now. Uh, there is a, a confidence there, which... Uh, I guess the Muslim doesn't often talk about, but it ought to be there. There's a well-known uh, story of one of the uh, men of uh, 14 centuries ago. He was about to be executed, in fact, crucified, by uh, the people in uh, Mecca, Hubayb, uh, I'm thinking of. And uh, the people who were about to kill him said, you can have a moment to make some prayers if you want. So he prayed very quickly, and then he came back. He said, I would have prayed longer, but you would think that I was stalling, and I was afraid, and I'm not. Let's get on with it. I shortened my prayer. So he was quite confident of what the situation was at that point. Uh, that's distinctly a possibility. It's just a matter of being honest with yourself to say, why have I done what it is I've done? What are my intentions? What brought me to here? Is it good or is it bad? That, that's something you know from the, from the inside. So how do you know things that you've done throughout your life, whether uh, God thinks that they're good enough for you? Yeah. I'm saying, you, you appear before him when you die. How do you know because I've done this, I'm good enough? I mean, yeah, it's not, a, it's not a question of precisely what is done. It's a question of intentions. That is, uh, it said if a man uh, made up his mind to uh, do a good thing and he got up to leave the house to go and do it, but he fell and broke his neck and died, uh, the credit is his as though he did it because what matters is that he was of that frame of mind that he was intending to do that. Whereas if a man made up his mind to do a bad thing and he broke his neck on the way, he has no, committed no crime, it's too bad he's in that state of mind, but he has committed no crime. Uh, in the third case, if a man made up his mind to do a bad thing, and then he changed his mind, he has credit for changing his mind. See, that is, it's a matter of the intention. What is the frame of mind that you're in? Not necessarily the value of your, your acts. The good things that people do have a certain value, but they really don't add up to anything like the compensation that comes back. As the one verse says, 
punishment that men receive is exactly equal to the wrong done. But the reward they receive is ten times greater than any good they actually ever did. That's using the, the figure ten, apparently figuratively, just to say uh, penalties correspond with crimes, but rewards are much greater than any particular good thing that was done. Well, my point would be that how do you know that your intentions are good enough? Well, it's a matter of being perfectly honest with yourself. That's all, and that takes practice. That's what. Uh, well, what is the, uh, the, uh, the part of God coming to account? How, does, how do you know that what you intend is good, is good in His sight? Well, it sounds like I'm not trying to make fun or anything, but that's a problem sometimes the psychologists talk about the scruples. That is, people who are paranoid about their own motivation. That is, it is always good to ask yourself, why do I do this? And you've got to be honest with yourself. But you can drive yourself insane if you're continually trying to accuse yourself of wrongdoing. To think back, a memory flashes across my mind, think, when I was six years old, I remember my mother picked me up. Was I sexually aroused? You know, that's mentally ill. But people can get into that state of mind if they're always doubting what is my intention. It's good to, on a regular basis, ask yourself, why do I really want to do this thing? But if you're convinced that I'll never know, then you're losing your mind. If you're convinced you will never know your own mind, I think you've lost it. The point I'm trying to make is that you will never know. I disagree 100%. You are saying a man will never know his own intentions, and I'm saying that should be an easy thing to do. Okay, then you have your opinion and I have mine. I think it's rather easy to know your own intentions. Yeah, I, I think I understand this question. I'm not trying to reword it, but um, what I'm trying to think of is, if in a comparison of two people, if uh, your intention is to do one thing, to to wear a coat and tie today because you think it's a good thing to do, and my intention was uh, to not wear a coat and tie, and I, I didn't think it was, you know, it was not necessary. In God's eyes, are your intentions better than mine, or in God's eyes, is each person's good intentions? for that particular person? Is there a standard of good intentions? Or does each person have the, do the best they can do according to their own scruples? Well, I suppose maybe what you're... That, that's a complex question in this sense that however I answer it, I'm agreeing with something you wrapped up in a question, which I disagree with. You've made it sound as though different people have different scruples. And that is basically what I disagree with. I'd say on the inside of every person is the same standard. The Quran says that men are made of one sort of thing. They have one kind of a nature that is human nature. It doesn't, uh, men are not produced in such a way that, well, some of them are a little more careful than others and so on. They get to be that way, but they didn't start out that way. They all have the same standards. If people develop different standards, it's precisely because of that. They have developed those different standards. Yeah, that's the one else. So you're saying that the essence of, of, of human would be a certain, uh, across the board, everyone would have the same... It should be the same. Okay, and that, I didn't hear you say that earlier, and that's why... I didn't, that's my fault. Okay. Yes. Uh, I really appreciate the way you presented yourself and, and your obvious intelligence and your competence in Scripture. And I appreciate the gentle approach that you've taken uh, both toward Christians and toward Muslims. Uh, do you uh, believe that uh, Muhammad taught that God gave the law to Moses? See, it's like a lot of questions that are asked uh, when you're put in a double bind of answer yes or no that eliminates any qualification as to the terminology that's used. Uh, you say, the law given to Moses. Uh, that he gave Moses a law, I have no no doubt. Yes, that, that's the basic Muslim position. That he gave Moses the law, which you can pick up in the public library, is another question. All right. But the only the only law that we have of Moses goes back to the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is about 200 years before Christ. Uh, so there's nothing older than that, and they have essentially agreed with the ones we had before that which were about a thousand years after maybe I should say Jesus but of course Muhammad called Jesus Messiah as you know but he didn't mean what Christians mean obviously uh, but the, the reason I'm asking is because the center of the Mosaic law was blood sacrifice 
And in Leviticus 17, it says that without blood sacrifice, there couldn't be atonement made for the soul. And it carries over into the Christian New Testament that there is a blood sacrifice made to make atonement for the soul, which is, of course, the blood of Christ. Okay. Uh, should, may, I, may I read a passage from Scripture to, to support what I'm saying? Or, or Go ahead there, that's not that long. Okay. It says, uh, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That just means that every, every human being has sinned. And I don't, I don't believe there's a person in here who thinks they haven't. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, or that's a, a way of reconciling, an atonement, through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins are, that are past through the forbearance of God. So the same system of atonement, the reason I'm saying this is because you said that the system of atonement is not worked out very clearly. The same system of atonement applies in the New Testament Scripture as in the Old, that is, blood sacrifice. That man has sinned, God demands blood. In the Old Testament, it was animal sacrifice. In the New Testament, it's the blood of Christ. I'm sorry, I gave you a hard time trying to get that out. I didn't know that's what you were getting at. Uh, the problem is, you should be arguing with the rabbi who will tell you that's not so. Uh, I'm always telling people that, and they have no reason to believe me, I guess. But I had the uh, good fortune a couple of years ago at uh, Emory University in Atlanta when there was a rabbi in the front row. And the same point came up, and I mentioned. The fact is, the Jews have never believed in blood sacrifice actually paying the penalty for sin. I said, if you don't believe me, ask the rabbi. He stood up with his thumbs in his suspenders. He said, the man is quite right. And so on. So really, they do not, and I suggest as a reference to the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia, points out that what you're talking about, the blood sacrifice paying for atonement, is a concept completely unknown to the Jews. That there were blood sacrifices, for sure, but what they were supposed to do is not the same kind of thing as Orthodox Christian doctrine talks about. It relates to such uh, places as the 31st chapter of Jeremiah. Uh, you find it in some of the minor prophets, the so-called minor prophets, where it's pointed out that uh, for example, it was said that uh, Israel was ransomed from Egypt, and the point is made that doesn't mean they were paid for, even though the language reads like that. They were not paid for. Uh, but anyway, I, instead of trying to convince you of all that kind of thing, I'd say go and ask the rabbi if that is so. Look it up in the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia or any other reference, but on redemption where the point has been made that the Christian idea does not correspond to the Jewish idea according to the Jews. And they've been using the same books long. It's a point that the Quran makes that matter. It says that the Jews and Christians, they use some of the same material and yet they disagree. Saying so this exhibits a difficulty, at least one of them is mistaken on this issue, or in various other issues. As to what the these verses themselves may mean when blood sacrifice is talked about even by in the Christian portion of Scripture, I'd say there's even room for some uh, disagreement. These positions have been taken by people like Universalists and uh, various others that uh, Jesus spoke uh, figuratively about uh, an awful lot of things and it's, uh, it may be unjust to take him literally here but not in that place. Uh, he said uh, that unless a, a, a corn of grain dies, it won't grow. He didn't really mean die, he means it goes in the ground. Uh, so maybe when he said, I'm going to die, he meant something like that and not literally die. It was Paul who said, I die every day. Didn't mean I really drop dead every day and then I get up. He meant something else. And the possibility has been there. It's not a popular Christian position, but the same words are open to other meanings by other people. I'm not even saying they're right, but I'm just saying this thing is not so unambiguous as it is sometimes portrayed. It's still very much an open uh, issue. I certainly think there's a sense in which you're right because uh, there are scriptures that say that God is not satisfied with the sacrifice of bulls and the blood of bulls. And so the Messiah answers back, but a body you have prepared for me. 
you know, you see, that is precisely, I should, shouldn't have even made it, maybe sound like an unkind comment, but I was saying that sometimes the uh, suggestion is made that uh, errors in uh, the Bible do not relate to major doctrines, and that's precisely the one I was thinking of that does. Because if you read in Hebrews, the passage which says, A body was prepared for me, look up the psalm that it's quoting from, and it gets the 40th psalm. It doesn't say anything there about a body. It says, God made an ear for me, which relates to an old miscopying of a Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures by whoever wrote Hebrews when he mistook two words that ran together that meant, God dug me an ear to God prepared me a body. And this major doctrine has been built upon what was a mistranslation by somebody centuries ago. Well, it's just a matter of pointing, and the the, uh, the Septuagint took it. Uh, the Greek Hebrew, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scripture, of course, took it as body, and so that's what uh, the writer of the Hebrews put down. You know, he took his quote straight out of Septuagint, as you say, a wrong translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. I realize that's controversial. Maybe I shouldn't even have, have tried to use it. Yes, and I don't mean to embarrass you. I appreciate your input, and I, and I want to give everybody else a chance as well. I, I don't want to get into a harangue. Or <laughs> Anybody else? Yes? Yeah, this is regarding your God-man dilemma. I was just uh, wondering why you chose to exclude any discussion over the physical resurrection of Jesus. Uh, and that is one of the main bases for showing divinity in why, why is the resurrection the basis of divinity? I hope I'm raised up someday. What will that make me? Divine? Uh, I mean, that whether or not Jesus was raised from the dead is, is another issue, but if I grant you that he was, what does that have to do with him being divine? It was a physical resurrection. Well, I uh, hope if I'm raised up, <laughs> I may look better than I do, but I hope it's a physical resurrection. I, I mean, I, I don't really see what that has to do with divinity. It's a uh, case of show and tell, you know. Jesus is divine. Look, he was raised up. It is not really... Well, if God would ever die, and uh, three days later came back to life. Yeah, I know, but suppose I tell you nobody, or suppose I tell you many people, what does it prove? As a matter of fact, uh, the documents or whatever you like that are passed down to us from the... Roman Empire of 2,000 years ago reported that this idea that someone was killed and raised up again was a rather common notion. There were lots of people making the same claims. They said this uh, Mithras, who had already enjoyed popularity in that area of the Mediterranean for 200 years before the time of Jesus, and it was said of various people, in fact, I'll bet you that in the next 12 months you'll read at the National Enquirer <laughs> that somebody was raised from the dead. I mean, that, it, it happened, uh, or reports of it were coming out all the time, and these people did not think that somehow that makes somebody divine. It, it's, what about the, how many people did Jesus supposedly raise from the dead? I've always wondered myself what it was like at the second funeral of Lazarus. You know, it, a man who was dead and then he was alive again, well, one day he must have died again, and I, I have very mixed feelings as a relative going to bury him again. Uh, but his actual resurrection doesn't establish the divinity of Jesus. And was it Elisha raised uh, an individual from the dead, according to the Bible, second king? <coughs> the resurrection itself it is all very interesting, but it's like virtually anything you can point to. How do you demonstrate an infinite God by pointing to some finite thing? Uh, th- there's nothing that a human being could ever point to and say, that thing, that proves the infinite God. <coughs> it establishes some power and ability uh, beyond mortal men or whatever, but you can't exhibit a thing that a man can look up in his eyes and say, that proves the infinite ability of God, or something like that. It, I mean, it technically cannot be done, because of the definition of the God that people are trying to prove. It's been for that reason that some Christian theologians have experimented with an interesting idea that God is finite, not infinite. That's very interesting. Uh, that solves a lot of these problems, I guess. Yeah. Okay, now some Christians claim that uh, Jesus uh, is God, so did ever Jesus said in the Bible that I am God and worship me? On the other hand, I'd like to ask if uh, there's so many interpretations of what Jesus said. Is that because nobody wrote it down when he said it? Or it's because it's written so uh, after a long, long time? Well, maybe a little both. I don't know, but the... Uh, 
there's not a whole lot that is reported that he said anyway. I mean, uh, there was one the newspaper man in the, my, my city in Toronto. He said, if you took all the words of Jesus, you could print them on the front page of the newspaper. Uh, there's not really that many words to, to go on that had been uh, handed down. But that was the point that I touched on there, which I was trying to explain to, to the Muslims sometimes, take it easy. When I travel around, it very often happens that somebody meets me at the airport and somebody I've never met before, and he picks up the bag and we head out to the car, and before we get to the car, before we're out of the parking lot, he says, does it say somewhere in the Bible that Jesus said he was God? Uh, and the, the answer is, well, yes and no. <laughs> it depends on, are you looking for precise words, or are you looking to find out what did he mean when he said this thing? That the Muslim has fallen into uh, what is really an unfair kind of a reply. If the Christian says, look here, Jesus says, I am the Son of God. And the Muslim says, oh, it must be a lie, somebody wrote that there. When he may well have said that, but now let's see, who was he talking to and what were they talking about when he said that? And uh, who says that Son should have a capital S there? Uh, and so on. Those are ideas of some of the people who have reproduced these things. But the episode I mentioned in particular is when the Jews said to Jesus, we are sons of God. And his reply was, no, you are sons of the devil. I'm the son of God. See, when they said we're sons of God, they didn't mean some kind of a claim to divinity. And when he said you're sons of the devil, he didn't literally mean your grandmother slept with the devil, I don't think. But why is it that he must literally mean, when he says I'm the son of God, only when I say son of God, I mean son of God, you know, capital S, son of God. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but it's a... Uh, it's unfair to insist that what he meant was this thing and not something like what the Jews meant when they were having this discussion as to whether or not people worshipped him. That's a, another one of these things that... It's a trick of language that the Quran accuses some people of doing. Worship used to mean, in English, what was worthy, worthy ship. In Canada, we still call the mayor of a city your worship. doesn't mean I think he's God. But it's just how you talk. And it used to be in English that if you stood up when somebody came into the room, they say you worshipped him. And it says in the Bible that a man came to Jesus one day and he worshipped him. If you look literally in the Greek, the word there, literally in Greek, means he blew him a kiss. Now people have done that to me. I don't like it, but I didn't think that they were worshipping me like, like I was God. You see? It's, it's just what was, was said. And, and what I'm getting at here is that, I believe it's the second chapter of Daniel... It says that Nebuchadnezzar came to Daniel and he worshipped him in the King James Bible. And you point to that and say, doesn't worship here sound more like just kind of a salute? Or he nodded his head toward him or shook his hand or did something like that? So that in most modern English translations, they've changed that to something else. But they have left alone the verse that says a man came to Jesus and he worshipped him. Because today, at least in many English-speaking countries, worship has a different flavor than it had long ago. Uh, today it, it seems to carry a, a lot of baggage that it didn't used to have. As I say, it still doesn't in many British areas. You won't find that argument cited by a Canadian generally. will not point to the place and say, what about when a man worshipped Jesus? You tell them, that's kind of silly. Even a little town of 500 people we call the mayor of worship. Uh, it's just a way of talking. Yeah. Can I do it again now? Just, just for the sake of what the Christian scriptures say, it's your day, and I'm, I'm, I'm not meaning to take you. You did a good job. But can I do it with, with Thomas and read that situation out of here? I can probably quote it for you without reading it, but <laughs> you're talking about my Lord and my God. Yeah. Uh, see, that's the same kind of. I think everybody knows the passage. Uh, Thomas. It's how Jesus responded that I'm interested in. What, how did you respond? Like this? You got it, Thomas, right on the nose. Uh, uh, Thomas, all right. Then Jesus said to, it, to Thomas, Reach here your finger and look at my hands. He's asking him to put his finger into the hole of his hand. And behold my hands. And put your hand and put it into my side. And don't be faithless, but believe me. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus' response is, Jesus says unto him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. 
So Jesus, I think, is backing up what Thomas says. He has him put his hand in the hole in his side. And when Thomas calls him, my Lord and my God, he blesses Thomas for having seen and believed. He doesn't say, far be it from God that he should have a son. Well, the point is that there's at least three ways that I know of that uh, Thomas's words can be taken. Uh, I don't use it as a matter of course, but it has happened to me that I've been surprised and I've said, my God. And the man in front of me said, yes, isn't it terrible? Uh, such and such a thing is true. He didn't say, no, wait, what do you mean? I'm not God. Uh, it may have been an expletive. He may have said, my Lord, my God. And what Jesus was then talking about was, you, Thomas, who didn't think I was raised up, now you've seen and you believe I'm raised up, so congratulations. Other people won't get to see the evidence, but they will believe. It's not necessarily an endorsement of some theological statement by Thomas. In any case, even if Thomas is addressing him, my Lord, my God, that has precedent in Scripture. The Muslim may not like it, but the precedent is there in the Bible of other people who were addressed as God without being God. When Moses spoke to the angel in the burning bush, he called the angel God. And Stephen explained later that it wasn't actually God, it was God's angel. But when God sends an angel and you speak to him, you might call him God. Moses was told, I'm sending you as God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. And in fact, the word as is added in italics in most English translations. It isn't there in the Hebrew. God says to Moses, I'm sending you to Pharaoh. You will be God, as far as Pharaoh is concerned. So there's this and, and other cases. The precedent is there for a human being or some other being to be addressed as God without being God. Paul talked about Satan as being the God of the world. So it's a largely a question maybe of God, capital G, or small g. Or, or let's say there's various ways of looking at it, but... I'm not arguing that your understanding of it is wrong so much as trying to point out the case is not closed by that. Other things are possible. Uh, it is unambiguous. I'm afraid that in a, a session like this, it maybe sounds like I'm trying to tell some people that they're wrong. My intention is more to say, if you think you have proved something, think again, find something uh, unambiguous or, or all-inclusive and wrap it up. And if you can do that, fine, then I will say, yes, you're, you're right. But for now, what passes as proof is largely uh, what is sometimes called synthetic reasoning. Uh, and that's not a criticism. Synthetic reasoning is when you, you take a lot of things and you form what seems to be a sensible conclusion, but it is not an inevitable conclusion. That's analytic reasoning. Synthetic reasoning is when you say that it's cloudy and the wind is blowing and the weatherman said rain, it's going to rain. That's synthetic reasoning. You haven't proved it's going to rain. See, analytic reasoning is where you have said A and B make C. There's no other possibility. That's analytic reasoning. Uh, these kinds of things are sold, in, in my opinion, as synthetic reasoning. I've never seen it sold any other way. Uh, that it, it, it's very coherent but it's not an inevitable conclusion that one arrives at. Other conclusions are possible based on the same input. I want to give somebody a turn that haven't spoken to the head. Did I ask you before? Sir, would you explain the, in other words, we talk about the Christian scriptures and their view themselves. Can you very quickly explain the Quran view of itself in relationship to Christian scripture and, say, Buddhist, Hindu, etc.? In other words, what, what validity does it get for its own uh, superiority if it claims that? Yes, uh, to start with, uh, it's not so much a matter of uh, a superior uh, kind of a scripture. That's maybe a, a largely a Muslim misrepresentation, which is a sort of a, uh, what would you call it, an over-enthusiastic uh, uh, patriotism or something like this. Uh, the Quran does not claim superiority in, in the usual sense that uh, people are talking about because the Bible and the Quran are different kinds of books. The Quran reads approximately like most of the so-called minor prophets and some of the pronouncements of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. It is not uh, like most of the Bible, uh, which are, are stories. That is, the book of Jonah begins by saying, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the son of Amittai saying, quote, sounds like what you're about to read came from God, from Jonah. Whereas the book of Luke begins by saying, 
Uh, in effect, what you're about to read is what I have gathered and put together because it seemed like a good idea. It seemed the appropriate thing to do to gather the evidence and write you this story. He doesn't say what you're about to read are words God has handed me and I'm now putting down on paper for you. Those are two different kinds of things. The Quran is like the former. That, that's why it's really rather short. It's about 80% the size of the New Testament. And it is pronouncements. If you read I, then this is God speaking. If you read you, it's you. It's God talking to whoever is reading this. So there are different kinds of books, largely. What it says of previous scriptures, uh, for one thing, is that it says of itself that it confirms the truthfulness of what is in previous scriptures. That is, certain things that have fallen into uh, debate, people who are arguing about certain things, if they were really important things, the Quran touches on them to say, no, it was correctly reported in that scripture on this matter, that it really it happened like that, confirms the truthfulness of previous scriptures. And this same verse is in the fifth the chapter. Also says of itself that it is, in the Arabic word is muhaymin, which is maybe best translated by the word quality control. It's, it's kind of a, a, a test uh, against other scriptures. That is, if uh, somebody brings something and says, this is scripture, and it says such and such, it may well be the Quran says that specifically is not so, and the evidence is in that place. Go and look. It's acting as quality control in that regard. But of course, it does not step by step go all the way through the Bible and the Hindu Gupta and various other scriptures and say chapter one is correct. There's one mistake in chapter two, and three in chapter four, and so on. It doesn't do that. It just talks about certain issues and the advice traditionally given to the Muslim right from the beginning was. That if, for example, the Christian comes and he says such and such is true and it says so in my book, and you don't have a reason to agree with him, then give him the benefit of the doubt. He might be right, he might be wrong, but don't insist he's wrong. Leave him with it unless you have evidence to the contrary. And so it is that a lot of what Muslims commonly talk about are really things that they may have picked up from the Christian or the Jew often to their detriment, I'm afraid. I mean, they pick up some of the fairy tales and carry them over as well. But uh, that's the key there, that it's confirming the truthfulness of, of key issues, and it's also setting the record straight on certain other things that people have misrepresented, and a great deal else it makes no comment on because it doesn't really matter. So it's, it's a man-made instrument to confirm or, or not confirm and then other supposed man-made instruments. Oh, no, it doesn't say of itself as a man-made instrument. As I said, it's uh, the speech of God to men. Uh, when you read it, it says, I, as God, and you, the reader. It's a pronouncement. Uh, like, uh, say, some, about 18 of the 66 books in the Bible that are, are like that, which they don't just tell the story of so-and-so, but they say, God told Hosea this, quote. Uh, it's of that nature. What I'm trying to make is that that its validity then is based on the fact, at least in part, that it says it has the right to confirm it or not confirm other books of Scripture. Uh, well, as to its validity, there's various approaches to that, but the uh, the one that's maybe the easiest to explain is that uh, the book, by its physical existence, in its paper and ink, demands an explanation of where did it come from and what it repeats many times is that uh, if somebody says the origin of this book is such and such, then ask them so and so and see if they still think that's true. And in another place, if they think this book came from such and such, remind them of this. So that a person is confronted with a book and he has to come up with an explanation of where did it come from, but what is the case if a person will pursue it is to find that that is not so easy to answer. All of the usual ideas, oh, well, probably it was this or it was that, have already been discussed in the book itself with an explanation as to why that can't be so. So you better come up with another reason. It's when you, you run out of options that you have a kind of a proof by exhaustion, which basically comes down to a, uh, either this man was deceived or was himself a deceiver. And uh, if you're going to explain all the facts, you need both of those assumptions. And the point is they eliminate each other. You, you cannot, at one time think you are a prophet and lie to people about it. Uh, that's 
you, you can't have it both ways. You could be neither a liar nor deceived, or you might be one or the other, but you can't be both. And so you're left with still this paper and ink unexplained what is its origin. And, and that, that's one way of looking at how does it establish that it deserves respect. It, there's also the, the influence that it has had, that it has accomplished certain things. That's why historians of science and language and philosophy will still point to the Quran and say that's the reason why the Arabs were suddenly civilized after 10,000 years of no preparation for civilization. Something in that book is a, uh, a stimulus. Um, I hesitate to mention that, I suppose, because Islam is not an Arabic sort of thing. Don't get that idea. 80% of Muslims don't speak Arabic anyway. <laughs> uh, the point is, it had a sudden impact, uh, and that needs an explanation that calls for some kind of an answer. Yes, don't be shy. Yeah. Is there any difference between the word uh, gospel and the word uh, Bible as it contributes to these scriptures? Oh, yes, that's maybe a point I should have dealt with. He's asking about words like Bible and gospel. Um, the Quran, when it talks about, when I said gospel, it's talking about Injil. It says in Arabic, Injil, which apparently is related to the Greek evangel, which is what is translated gospel. It was a long time ago. Today it might better be translated as good news. But Injil, this evangel, was a message. It wasn't a, necessarily a book someplace. It was uh, in the second century that the collections of, of the accounts of the life of Jesus got the nickname Gospels. When technically, uh, virtually any Christian makes that distinction to say, well, these are the four Gospels, but the Gospel of Jesus is, is a message. It's not these four books. These four books have the Gospel in them somewhere. So the Quran is talking, well, what was it Jesus said, not what are those four Injils there? Uh, as to Bible, that was my point in the first place, that that's just a, an English nickname. It just means library. It's a collection of, of writings. In other languages, they sometimes don't call it that. What the Germans call Heilige Schrift, they're, they're, they're holy writings and so on. Bible just happens to be a convenient name. So that, as such, the Quran talks about people who use books, or use the book, book people, but it doesn't say people who use that book. The Revised Standard of 1881, or something like that. It's just people who are in the habit of using a book to support their position are people of the book, without spelling out Bible, or the Gospel according to Matthew, or something like that. Okay, so maybe that's all our time. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Gary uh, <coughs> Miller, and uh, thank you for our audience. They told me that today, it's not an appropriate time for such a lecture because it's uh, Monday, Monday night, and it's the uh, opening season for the football. <laughs> 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 Nevertheless, we have uh, a good turnout, and I think uh, the people who have gathered here to hear this lecture, uh, they will go back and think about it. And this is the message which we have uh, if we can go back with it, this is the message. And that nothing we have to take for granted or just to follow blindly. And this is the quality, the gray matter which, we, which have been bestowed on us, we have to use it because we are accountable for it and that's the distinction between uh, man and animal. Uh, thank you very much. And there are really very interesting questions, but I don't want even to comment on the answers of Brother Gilly Miller because he is an American and he has been responding actually to people who are in the same level of the culture. So my comments might be distracting. Thank you very much and uh, I would like uh, to uh, invite you all here that uh, the Islamic Center uh, is open, welcoming and uh, you are uh, welcome to visit at any time, not to be teach, but to teach also. And we are fortunate here to have uh, some visits from the local churches who will come sometimes, not uh, only to ask us about what we believe, but to tell us 
about what they believe. And I think this will give uh, people an opportunity uh, to think and consider what they believe in. Uh, uh, in the name of the uh, MSO, Muslim Students Organization and Islamic Center, thank you very much and have a nice evening.